Well, back in the uh, late 1950s, I was secretary treasurer of a group called the Chicago Freedom Action Committee. And we were engaged in dealing with problems of, fighting problems of racial discrimination in the Chicago area. We heard about this wonderful movement that was launched in Montgomery, Alabama, where an obscure minister had organized people into nonviolent direct action, protesting, boycotting the um, segregation of the bus system. And so we brought him north to come speak and to raise money for the effort. And that's when I first met Dr. Martin Luther King. And it was evident immediately that he was a very special kind of person. Deep commitment, good sense of humor, rich understanding of, of people, total dedication to the attributes that we just talked about that are essential for social workers, to be sensitive to cultural differences, to be persistent, to be um, committed to social justice and social change, to beneficence, to uh, the understanding of other people, responsive, to take sensible risks. All the attributes that Bruce Jansen talks about in the opening chapters of his book that are essential for you in your practice. I uh, continue to follow the work of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And in the 60s, the civil rights movement became galvanized by actions of a group that came out of a parallel uh, nonviolent direct action effort in Nashville, Tennessee. A student nonviolent coordinating committee emerged largely under the tutelage of Dr. James Lawson, who is a retired minister, pastor emeritus of a Methodist church quite near here at the school. And I hope that someday you'll have the opportunity to see him as other classes of social work students at USC have been able to. In 1960, the nation elected Robert Kennedy president. And he appointed his brother, Bobby, to be his attorney general. We hoped then that this would mean that there would be an administration that would begin to implement rulings that had come out of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in 1954 had found that separation was inherently unequal. But in order to get that unanimous decision, the Warren Court uh, had to put in words like, with all deliberate speed. Or to the South, that meant moving at the rate of a tortoise. Uh, there was massive resistance to the implementation of desegregation all across the South. And the court also ruled in the 50s that it was a violation of equal protection to require that passengers in interstate travel on trains or in buses be segregated until the Supreme Court ruling. Persons who took a train across the Mason-Dixon line going south of Virginia or Tennessee or Kentucky, crossing that line would have to move to a separate Jim Crow car. And people on buses would have to, if they were black, would have to sit in back and they had separate ticket windows and uh, separate bathrooms, separate waiting rooms, and all the interstate facilities. Well, the trains quickly accepted the ruling of the court, but the buses did not. And even though Dr. King had been able to desegregate the buses of Montgomery, Alabama, buses engaged in interstate travel still continued to segregate Greyhound and trailways. We hoped that with this new president, we talked about moving from enacting a policy to implementing it. 
Well, we hoped that now that the policy had been enacted by the Supreme Court, it would be implemented by this new Attorney General. And we tried to convince him to enforce it. First time I met Bobby Kennedy, I was uh, dragged out of his office by my hands and feet and dumped very ceremoniously down the stairs and into a waiting paddy wagon. He was not about to engage in that activity. I don't mean to slight Bob Kennedy. He learned from this experience. He grew. He became a great leader and a great advocate for this. And we ended up being friends. In fact, one of the last letters he wrote, he wrote to me after I'd been elected a delegate on his behalf from the District of Columbia. So um, he changed. But at this point, it was early in his career as an attorney general, and he didn't want to take on the southern states so early in his career. Uh, a group called the Congress of Racial Equality, headed up by a guy named Jim Farmer, announced its intentions to put a group of persons together, and it was a very small group, there were about eight or nine of them to start out with, to take the buses across America from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans and across the South. And at each point, they would integrate the facilities as well as the buses in which they rode. And they set out from Washington, D.C. in early May of 1961. They got as far as um, Atlanta, and from there, divided into two. They increased their numbers. So they had six or seven on each of two different buses, one on the trailways, the other on a Greyhound. The trailways bus, on its way to Birmingham, was firebombed. And uh, people had to push their way out, choking the smoke of, of the firebomb. And uh, they were beaten mercilessly by a group of white hoodlums. The other bus, the Greyhound, went into Birmingham itself, where they were beset upon by another group of white hoodlums. A guy named uh, Bill Barbie had his back broken. John Lewis, who was the spokesperson for this group of six or seven uh, freedom riders, and, the, and those who could still walk, were arrested by the sheriff, um, Bull Connor, taken in a car to the Tennessee-Alabama state line, walked across the state line and told never to come back into the state of Alabama again. Well, they walked and walked on the Tennessee side of the border until they came to a telephone, called Diane Nash in Nashville, who ran the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And in three or four hours, Diane appeared with two cars, brought John Lewis and the other Freedom Riders back to the bus terminal, where after a day of haggling and delaying, and they tried to get on board a bus. Well, the riots that had taken place both in Anniston and in, uh, and in Birmingham resonated in the office of the Attorney General, and Bobby Kennedy did get mobilized. He sent Bob Siegenthaler from the Justice Department to meet with Governor Patterson in Montgomery, Alabama, and demand that there be protection by the state for the people who were the Freedom Riders. And if he didn't, said Bobby Kennedy, we're going to send in federal marshals. Not wishing that to happen, the governor had a fleet of motorcycles, squad cars, surround the bus upon which John Lewis and the others finally were able to, uh, to ride. This is the same John Lewis who is now a proud member of Congress in Atlanta. Back then, he was a guy out of the uh, Atlanta Bible College who had learned at the hands and at the feet of Jim Lawson how to engage in student nonviolence to bring about social change. Uh, they rode this bus, helicopters flew overhead until they got into the city of Montgomery. The helicopters disappeared, the squad cars, the motorcycles disappeared, the doors opened, and a mob set upon them and beat them bloody. That night, 
Martin Luther King called a mass meeting at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. That night, Jim Farmer, who had started this, flew back to be with his father, who was, who'd had a stroke, and he called off the Freedom Ride, saying he could not subject um, other people to this violence. SNCC appealed to Dr. King and said, you've got to keep these thing, this thing going. And Dr. King, when he called this mass meeting, promised that we shall not be moved, that we shall overcome, that we shall go on. A group of a very angry white mob surrounded the church, and Bobby Kennedy deputized federal marshals to come between the church and this angry white mob who stood beyond the periphery of marshals and threw in rocks and flaming oil-soaked rags into the church until finally the people in the church had to cough their way out because of the smoke. But they did so with the assurance by Dr. King that we shall not let this deter us, we shall go on. That next morning is when I received the call I'd been fighting for civil rights since a teenager, but to get a call from Dr. King, who said, we need, we need you. We need you until we can get that group of students who are coming out of the schools in June to pick up the slack. We'll have a new body of recruits, but we need to maintain the momentum. Well, I called my office. I was then the research director of the Chicago Commission on Youth Welfare, told my boss that I was taking the next two weeks off for vacation, got on the next plane to Atlanta, where I was met by Julian Bond and several others. I was made the spokesman for the group. We went through a brief nonviolent direct action training program that, with which we were familiar from our Chicago workshops, but it helped to be reminded and be given directions and instructions and got on the next bus to Montgomery, all along the way. There were white citizens councils that came out to greet the bus, to jeer and hoot at us, to hold up their vicious signs um, and police cars guarding the white citizens. And everywhere that we stopped, we went into the rest stops or the ticket stations the whites going to the black windows, the blacks going to the white windows. We went to the black bathrooms, the whites, the, the blacks went to the white bathrooms, and so on. By the time we reached Montgomery, um, we, were, we were all very, very tense. And there were only seven of us. But uh, as we exited the bus, there was a minor pandemonium. It wasn't exactly a riot, but there was a lot of pussing, pussing and shoving and yelling and screaming. And I was shoved into a colored cab, as they called them. Everything was segregated, especially, well, I shouldn't say especially, but including the cabs. I was taken to the home of Ralph David Abernathy, where we met. And I had to be snuck into somebody else's home because it was illegal in the South for a white person to sleep in the home of a black person. Um, I met some very brave people in Montgomery, like Ms. Virginia Durr, whose husband was the model for the lawyer in To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, there are good people, even white, good white people in the South. There were then, and there are today. And the next morning, fortified with a wonderful Southern breakfast, I went down to the bus terminal. And we did our thing. I went into the colored waiting room and waited there and did the colored bathroom. And the whites, the blacks that did the same in the white bathrooms and the white waiting room. And nobody was going to stop us because they knew they were violating the law, but they still had these old customs. And we were trying to break the custom. Well, they called a... Uh, the next bus for Jackson, which was our next leg of the journey, 
We rushed out to the platform, and the bus driver said, I'm not going with those people. So he shut the door and disappeared. We went back and did our thing again with the waiting rooms and the uh, bathrooms and the ticket counters and the restaurant. And it was obvious we were being watched, and we pretty quickly spotted a guy with a bow tie, figured he was FBI, and other people who hovered around him, and they whispered to one another. So finally, I went up to the guy with the bow tie, and I said, look, uh, we're going to be here all day and all night, I mean, whatever it's going to take. And you know you're going to get a complaint from the Justice Department that you're blocking interstate traffic by not letting the buses go forward. He said, I don't know who you think I am. I said, I think I know who you are. And uh, you're just going to have us, well, anyway, they, got a, they, they ultimately called a bus. They pulled it up. I got on board the bus. They slammed the door behind me. Did one of the others go, no, I'll get off. I'll wait. Went back to my FBI contact. I assume he was. <laughs> Gave my little speech. And uh, eventually, they let the rest of us on the bus. Well, and with all this fuss, there was this one young lady came up to me and said, are you freedom riders? I said, yep. I want to become one. This is a auburn-haired white woman from New England who was going to New Orleans, and uh, she wanted to know where she could sign up. And she did. She, was a, she subsequently became a freedom rider on a, on a later bus. I sat in the back with the black passengers, and a man turned to me and said, I fought for my country in World War II. Now I want to fight for my people. What can I do? So said, well, follow me. He walked up to the front of the bus. There were two empty seats. I asked him to sit one just across the aisle from where I sat down. And so we were helping to integrate that bus. I sat there chatting with him. I knew I had to go work my way back to the black part of the bus. But while we were chatting, and the woman sitting next to me um, was a white woman, said, uh, I want to move into that seat because I'm fixing to get off soon. So I stood up in the aisle and let her move into the aisle seat. And then she said, and I thought I would sit next to her because I was still carrying on the conversation with this black veteran. Over the hoots, I might say, of some of the white passengers who were calling me nigger lover, communist, stirring things up, messing up our way of life. And the woman, instead of moving over into the, fully into the aisle seat, put her foot up, her feet up, over on, on the window part of the seat to block me from sitting down next to her. And I said, well, ma'am, I, I, I wanted to sit there. She said, well, I got titillations in my legs, and I need to stretch them out. So I thought you said you were going to get off at the next stop. Well, I changed my mind. I got these titillations in my leg. Well, the bus began to fill up. I made other stops along the way. With the signs outside always, these white citizens' leagues, shouting at us. And I finally convinced the woman that it was unfair for her to be seated, taking two seats while there were people standing in the aisle. So she moved fully over into the aisle seat, and I gestured to a black woman who was standing just beyond me and offered the seat to her. So this woman crawled over the woman and sat down. Well, just then we came to a town that I'd never heard of before. This was 1961 place called Selma, Alabama. This was well before the Selma movement. The bus driver slammed on the brakes, rushed over to one, some of the squad cars, and came back on board the bus with the sheriff, a guy named Jim Clark. Jim Clark grabbed me by the throat like this and said, uh, you a nigger lover? I love all people. I've been trained to say that. 
other passengers said, yeah, he's one of them. He's one of them freedom riders. He's one of the communists that come down here from up north, said the other passengers. Turns to the woman who was sitting on the aisle seat next to where I was standing and said, he been bothering you, lady? No, 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 Sheriff, he ain't been bothering me. Well, I think he has been. The passenger said, yeah, he's been bothering her. He's been bothering her. I don't want any trouble, Sheriff. I, I, I got my folks waiting for me in Texas. I don't want any trouble. Don't worry, ma'am. This bus ain't going nowhere so long as you aren't on it. But you're going to come with us for a little while. And we'll hold this bus for you. You'll get to Texas. Took her off the bus. And she literally ran, titillating legs and all, <laughs> to the squad car. Put clamped handcuffs on me. I gave some heroic little speech thinking it was going to be the last thing I was ever going to say in my life to the effect of, that's OK. They can stop me, but they can't stop us. And I felt like I was in a B-grade movie, you know. I, but I was going to give a, that, that, that impassioned speech, and I gave it. And I said, we'll come on until all people are free to black and white to ride anywhere in the South. And, you know the kind of speech I gave. I carted off to the private law offices of Judge Hugh Mallory, charged with disturbing the peace and assault. Assault? Well, I had engineered this woman to rub up against the legs of the woman with the titillating legs. And so I was the assaulter. And I was going to be held on, ba on $1,500 ba bail or bond, $1,500 bond, um, for each of two charges, 3000 bucks. Well, that's equivalent to about 10000 or more today. And I had about $20 and some change in my phone. We were told not to have much money with us. I appealed to the judge. It was pointless. I was going to be held until trial. That woman would be coming back from Texas sometime in July, if at all. And they're going to have to hold me until she could come back to testify. This was me. The sheriff took me to the cell block. Now, I wrote notes. I'm just not able to repeat this, except by looking at my notes, so I hope you'll forgive me. These are notes I wrote as I was recuperating from this experience. And they're pretty intact, they're pretty, pretty clearly what happened. It contains a great deal of profanity, and I hope people will accept that and understand it. And. Uh, It has the authenticity of that moment. I've already the solid steel door clangs shut. My heart sank and I struggled to be brave, humming to myself, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. My whole world disappeared on the other side. I'm going to let it shine. Thrust into a dark corridor, as I saw it, in the camp of desperate, bigoted white convicts. Would this be my antechamber to death? It really didn't seem quite real. Not yet. This little light of mine. But I, I faced what I was convinced would be the emptiness of the hereafter. Struggling to recall the 27th Psalm, as Reverend Ralph Abernathy had selected it for us, even though an army were arrayed against me, my heart would have no fear, but fearing I would dead. And falling back on the songs by which I had been enveloped in Baptist churches, north and south, with the ardor of our crusade, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
I concealed the terror from myself. Maybe it was some sort of shell shock, self-denial, but I, I rationalized the sense of historical inevitability and morality of purpose, convinced that this was the best legacy I could leave my three infant children. This was, after all, the cause to which I dedicated my life years ago, when any chance of success seemed so remote and unlikely. And now, it belongs to those who have stood up for themselves, refusing to remain victims of discrimination. I felt good, but what I wouldn't give to be among them now. The warden took me from the sheriff and pushed me into a cell with barely enough room to stand alongside a cot, in front of a toilet bowl without a seat, no windows, no lights, only a bare concrete floor. Thank God it was a single. I had no roommates. I tossed in the cot, disavowing feelings with a protective numbness. It all seemed so third person. I was out of my skin, resigned to die here for the statement of a purpose in my life. I mused intermingling freedom songs with the only prayer I knew, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Hebrew pronouncement of monotheism wrapped up in the comfortable memory of my mother pronouncing the words at my bedside just before she would sing the Brahms lullaby in her native German. As I tossed on my concrete cot in Selma, I felt a deep ache, and I knew I was a long way from home. Too soon, it seemed, the lights went on, banter among the other prisoners about wet dreams and pissing, clanging at the bars of my cell. Somebody pushed a tin of inedible food onto the floor and disappeared. From the other cells, men were chortling about George being locked up for being drunk again. And then they started needling me. Asked who the fuck I was, why the fuck I was here, and do I fucking know where I am? I gave my name, tried to sound low key, said I was charged with disturbing the peace. They laughed and jeered. Must have been some peace. Chester here broke him some lady's neck. That was breaking a peace. And there was laughter. Where are you from, they probed. What the fuck you doing here in Selma? I was on my way to New Orleans. New Orleans, listen to him. What kind of shit face? Where are you from? Sounds like New York. You from New York, shit face? Chicago, Chicago, shit cargo. Same fucking thing. A guard collected my tin of food. As I pushed it back through the bar, seeing that it was untouched, he sneered something about not having the right attitude. Gonna be real hungry. You'll wish you had every damn thing on your goddamn plate. My dungeon door opened, and I was ordered out into the bullpen, along with five other prisoners who clambered out of two of the other cells, containing four bunks each. Five grungy white men eyed me. Everything in Alabama was segregated by law, especially the law and the jails. I went into the, went to the little heap of paperbacks, found the Bible, and tried to ignore the mumbling of the other prisoners, speculating on my likely being one of them coon-sucking perverts from Chicago. When we were ordered back into our cells and the deputy sheriff stomped into the aisle beyond our bars, shoving two stumbling good old boys before him. There he is, he pointed to me. There's the goddamn fucking freedom rider. The good old boys, reeking with alcohol, leaned into each other and against the deputy sheriff. You like to get your mom into bed with one of them black bucks, boy? Who are these guys? I asked the deputy sheriff, wondering how they could get into the sanctorum of a prison. Are they officials of the court, the city, the state? Why are they here? Nah, they're just ramblers. The whole town's talking about you, boy, and they're just taking a good look. Gee, you little punk, one of the ramblers drawled. We here are knights of the Ku Klux Klan. You heard me, you shit-faced, cringing little kike. I know you here to the Klan. We take care of things around here. We don't like your coming into our town from someplace up north where you got all them riots and crime and nobody's safe on the streets. 
We got a good town. We get along fine with our niggers. Take good care of them. Coon's been happy and content just the way things are. They got no complaints. Any of you guys ever hear any coon complain? Prisoners all chimed in about how happy black folks are in Selma. They sure don't want any trouble. You want to get them all excited, said the other Klansmen, thinking they can riot and steal and rape our women the way they do up north. Stunned, I remained silent as the Klansmen, obsessed with the size of African-American genitalia and their irresistibility to white womanhood, rambled on with their prurient inquisition. How do you like a nigger to fuck your sister? Want your wife to have some of his tar baby pickaninnies? Nah. You want to shove some nigger up against my wife? Who the fuck do you think you are trying to have niggers fucking my wife? The deputy sheriff pulled a lever opening the cell doors to the bullpen, and the five prisoners tore through that side of our cell block to grab and haul me out of my cell and to pin me back. Answer them questions, the, per the person whose arm locked my neck ordered, or I'll slap it out of you. I thought of Chester's piece and tried to feel like Abernathy or Martin King or Wyatt Walker, but I knew I was failing the test. We are all the children of God, I repeated, trying to convince myself as much as them. And I believe that we are all brothers, I intoned, silently praying to be forgiven for my mendacity. The threats persisted, but the violence didn't begin until the Klansmen, fixing to leave, told the prisoners that if they were in that cell, they'd whip the pulp out of me, and that as Southern gentlemen, they should do their duty to defend segregation and the cause of the South. As I was pulled up by the throat hole of my shirt by an enormous brute, the deputy sheriff cautioned, you can take care of him, boys, but the FBI has been asking about him, so don't leave no marks. Chester here don't mind, said George. He's in for murder. The deputy sheriff and the Klansmen left amid, amid peals of laughter. And the meeting began. Chester dangled me like a top. Shouted, you think a nigger's as good as my wife? I trembled out my pious phrase. We are all equal in the eyes of the Lord. She yet, said Chester, as he slapped me to the ground. Slowly I stood back up, recited another verse of the 27th Psalm. Though war should rise up against me, even then will I be confident. What kind of chicken shit fuckhead are you? Come on, defend yourself. Two prisoners took over the assault, beating me with their open hands across my face, head, back, chest, and stomach. I was in the service for nine years, a black-haired, ashen-faced hoodlum, in for grand larceny, boasted. Where I got showed how to whack troublemakers without leaving no marks for the FBI. I fought and risked my goddamn life for this country in the war, a blonde Aryan awaiting extradition to Michigan reminded his buddies. To keep things the way they were, and this son of a bitch comes down here to change everything any of us fought for. And I realized that nothing our government had ever done during World War II could have given them the slightest hint that the freedom they fought for was meant for all Americans. Segregated troops and rank discrimination only reinforced the Southern way of life. The grand larceneur slapped me so hard I could not hear for a harrowing while. He swore he'd whack me so bad he'd break both my eardrums, lying through my teeth. I told the fiend that I was trying to love him. He spat and stalked off. The blonde awaiting extradition ripped the Bible from my hands and threw me to the ground on top of it. I picked up the good book and returned to the recitation. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The two of them started over, slapping and whacking with open hands. My ears were on fire, and I was sure I'd never hear again when suddenly the beating stopped. Dave, a thin-framed black porter, bent over a wet mop, shuffled into the bullpen. So long as he was there, mopping the concrete 
floor of the bullpen, and each cell in turn, I could live. Dave smopped every corner, good and clean, never looking at anyone, never speaking. We were bonded. While the prisoners exchanged carnal comments, I tried to think about other times and places, happier moments that mingled my ideals with their illusions. Dave withdrew, and Chester got some of the other guys to squat in back of me so that he could push me over them. I was yanked up and pushed over the stooping stooge again and again. We gets along just fine here, George the drunk asserted. Don't need no goddamn communists riding no goddamn buses stirring things up. Just to pound a few more blows into my solar plexus. Ain't it a bitch, the grand larceny complained. He thinks he and some goddamn federal government are going to come down to Dallas County and tell us how to treat our niggers. Fucking communists ought to go back to Russia, the blonde fugitive from Michigan chimed in. From time to time, it seemed like they had to be talked into the need to protect white womanhood before resuming their onslaught. The deputy sheriff reappeared. It's OK, boys. You don't need to worry about not having, leaving no marks no more. We got a necktie party out there for him. And if you don't leave here feet first, he ain't leaving this town no other way. I made my peace. It would all be over soon. Now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Yeah, like David, Shema Israel, the Lord our God. I was being beaten with a greater fury. The blows went on for a long time and I could no longer stand up straight. But I was elsewhere. I had known men like these as boys. I saw their hatred in the eye and the eyes of pasty fa <laughs> in the eyes of pasty faced teenagers who tucked back the sleeves of their t shirts to flaunt flexed muscles, blocking access to my high school when the first Negro family moved into the district. It was the only picket line I ever crossed. They won. The school redrew the lines, and I had to fight my way home for two years. But I discovered the comfort and joy of an adjacent black community and the enthusiastic commitment of CORE. It was just getting formed, the Parkway Community Center. It became my refuge. Those harsh voices were the sounds of white citizens throwing rocks and flaming oil-soaked rags at the home of Roscoe and Ethel Johnson, the first African Americans to move across 71st Street. I moved in with them and called in reports to the University of Chicago NAACP, the City Human Relations Commission, anyone who would press the police to do their duty and protect the Johnsons. And they became part of the AME church that rallied to their defense. In the end, each struggle led to expressions of companionship and joy with people I came to love. It was the songs of those moments that filled me now. We're fighting for our freedom. We shall not be moved. I tried to catch my breath, but my chest hurt too much. And then Dave appeared, mopping the floor again. How come you're back so soon, Dave? Miss some little speck somewhere? Prisoners taunted the shuffling porter. This shithole ain't never been this clean. Never took that much tension before. I knew Dave was there for me, but neither one of us could say a word. There was where and how he lived, and he held out as long as he could. But as we both knew, he'd have to be. He was driven off. In the Dallas County Jailhouse, I was limp, coming in and out of consciousness, listening to the men whip each other up with their justifications to kill me. I was the Antichrist, allied with men they had dehumanized as animals lusting for their wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters. They had to protect their women in their way of life. They stopped me, but I would not give them the satisfaction of my pain. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. It would be over soon. I drifted into a kind of twilight, trying to recapture that exhilaration we felt in churches and rallies. We would overcome. Please, God, let my kids know that I went with dignity. 
And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. The pounding stopped. And go home to my Lord and be free. Were they coming to carry me off? Was I totally out of it? An apparition of Dave loomed from the end of the bullpen, staring straight at me, then gently tossing something to where I lay on the floor. You can get dressed, it said, and I felt the touch of my corduroy pants and cotton shirt. Your lawyers are here for you. Dave's words resounded in my head, pumped bright red, refreshed, revolutionary blood to my heart, ran down my limbs, got me into my clothes, stood me in the awe of their echo on my stocking feet, stood me in wonderment and awe. He set my shoes just inside the bars, and I never saw him again. Quietly but with palpable contempt, the deputy sheriff put me in the hands of three impeccably dressed gently mannered, earnest black lawyers. Solomon Say, Jr., who is now a member of the state senate in Alabama. Fred Gray, who is a federal court justice in Alabama. And Charles Conley came with FBI protection to take me out of that prison. They were protected with, with FBI and their news reporters. There were flash cameras aimed at me. As I came out of the jailhouse, I suddenly let the tears that I had really restrained, I had not sobbed, I had not let anything flow from my eyes, but they suddenly just burst forward. I remember the first thing that I said it was uncontrollable. How do you keep from hating white folks? Because I had learned to hate in that short while in that jail. As we opened up the door to the Dallas County Courthouse, there was this huge white mob standing there facing me, jeering. And across the street from them was an almost equally large mob of blacks. People who later wrote about the history of the Selma movement talked about it began when this guy from up north got himself arrested. <laughs> I had no conscious impact, but there it was. Let me talk about the impact of what we do. It began with this crazy guy from the north getting himself arrested and thrown into jail. And I was being marched by FBI and by cops and by state police between the two mobs to a waiting convoy of cars that took me back to Montgomery, where I was lifted into a bed. It was the bed that Reverend Abernathy and his wife, it was their bed. It was a wonderful soft down quilt. And they slept in another bed and put me in their bed, where I stayed for about 10 days. Every rib in my body had been broken. <laughs> I was a wreck. Uh, I didn't dare go to a white hospital, and the law wouldn't have allowed me to go to a black hospital. But black physicians came and taped me up and took care of me. And on my last day, it was a Sunday, um, I was taken to a plane, but on the way, I um, go back to my notes. I was brought to the First Baptist Church where Reverend Ralph David Abernathy presided, and after the choir finished singing, I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Reverend Abernathy talked a bit about me and gestured to have me stand on my clutches proudly beside him. Did they beat you, Brother Ralph? He asked. And I said, they can knock me about, 
but they can't beat us. And all together, we held hands and sang, we shall overcome. Well, I went back, I was flown back to Chicago and I was in the hospital, Michael Reese Hospital for a few weeks. And I got word from my boss that I had embarrassed him. That was a newly elected mayor, Richard Daly. And I had embarrassed him and he wanted my resignation. And NASW said, don't you dare resign. And ministers and rabbis came to visit me and said, don't you dare resign. And they all wrote letters to the mayor and said uh, how great it was that he had somebody on his staff who had done this. So uh, when I was able to come back to work, I'd been relieved of all of my duties. My office was empty except for my desk and a chair. When I went to staff meetings, chairs in front on each side of me and in back of me were empty. I was given the silent treatment. Nobody dared talk to me. And after many months, I um, accepted a job to become director of a settlement house in Washington, D.C. And I'll tell about many of my adventures in the settlement house because it will be illustrative of things that we can do as social workers. But because I was at the settlement house and uh, was a member of the National Federation of Settlements and Neighborhood Centers, I was made their delegate to the leadership conference on civil rights. And there again, I picked up with Dr. King because there he was struggling to get through some legislation on civil rights. And under the direction of Bayard Rustin, who was his right-hand person at the leadership conference on civil rights, got involved in lobbying, got involved in working getting people in the D.C. area to lobby. I got myself elected to the president, be president of NASW for the Metropolitan Washington area. So I double, did double duty. I was the representative of both the social workers and the settlement houses and the leadership conference on civil rights. And we had these regular meetings at the Methodist Center, which is just right near the Capitol building in uh, the center of Washington, D.C. And In the course of this, I remember bringing Dr. King to visit my settlement house. And there are stories about that, but I won't burden you with that. I'll just wrap it up with one final story because it applies to each of us today. We were getting ready for the March on Washington, a march that incidentally had been initiated by A. Philip Randolph way back during that war in which we fought with segregated troops. A. Philip Randolph had gone to Eleanor Roosevelt and said that they wanted an executive order integrating the armed forces, and if we didn't get it, that we were going to have a march on Washington. And Eleanor said, well, let me talk to the president about this. She set up a meeting with the president. And they just came up with this, they, A. Philip Randolph and uh, I have time to tell the story a little bit. A. Philip Randolph was head of the sleeping car porters, and they were very crucial to the whole civil rights movement, even before there was a civil rights movement, way back in the 30s and 40s, because the sleeping car porters were the guys who went on these trains that left Chicago and went down on the Illinois Central and other trains into the south, into the southern states. And they took with them copies of the Chicago Defender, which was published by Louis Martin. And it called for civil rights and equal rights. And they would distribute these newspapers in every southern town and hamlet the train passed. And so it was he and Louis Martin and Walter White, who was then head of the NAACP, who met with the president during the war and said that they wanted the troops to be desegregated. And FDR was scared to desegregate the troops because most of the training camps, most of the army camps were in the south and there would be riots. On the other hand, most of the industry, the war industry was in the north and in California. And so he issued an executive order ending segregation in the 
war plans, that is, demand, setting up a Fair Employment Practices Commission. That was the final compromise. But to get to that compromise, this group that met with the president had to threaten a march on Washington. And it was something that was just coughed up in the last minute, actually, by a Philip Randolph. And FDR looked at him. Doris Kearns Goodwin writes about this in her book, a uh, wonderful book that you should read someday, No Ordinary Time. She talks about this period. And uh, FDR was panicked about the notion of a, of a march on Washington in the middle of the war. They would divide the loyalties of the troops and of the nation. And uh, so how many people could you produce? And I'm sorry, I goofed this up a little bit. He came up with this when I met with Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said, how many people could you produce? And they filled Randolph said 50,000. And afterwards, they got to talking with one another. And they said, well, let's up it when we talk with the president. So when they got to the meet with the president, they said 100,000. <laughs> All this made out of just whole cloth. Well, that got the president to come out with his executive order establishing the Fair Employment Practices Commission. But now, long after the war, we're in the 1960s, 1963-64, and the A. Philip Randolph Institute hired Bayard Rustin to, to fulfill that dream of a march on Washington. And here we were, sitting around a table and talking about mobilizing our various constituencies and uh, Bayard Rustin was asking people, well, how many people can the steel workers produce? And they talked about, oh, two, three thousand, you know. And how many people from the United Auto Workers? Well, we'll be people from Detroit. We can get five to ten thousand. And uh, how many people from the Union of American Hebrew Congregations? We'll get all of our synagogues on the East Coast. We'll get three thousand, you know. And people were talking in these bold numbers. And then they came to the social workers. And Dr. King leaned over and said, Brother Ferdig, can we count upon the social workers? And I said, well, Dr. King, I believe we can. He said, well, belief is a fine attribute. I support belief. But can we count upon the social workers? I said, yes, Dr. King, I think we can count on a couple thousand social workers. Well, we got probably better than 10,000. We brought them. We brought them in buses from every city on the East Coast, New York and Richmond and Baltimore and Philadelphia. And we brought them from Cleveland. We brought them on train from Chicago and by plane from, from Los Angeles and from Denver and from Houston. And uh, nobody really knew what that day was going to be like. There had never been a march like that. There had been lots of marches since then. But this was the first, the first time this kind of a march on Washington. Was there going to be a riot? Was the Ku Klux Klan going to turn out? Was there going to be all kinds of violent protests? We organized all kinds of teams and security squads, as we called them. We were going to surround people and uh, sort of insulate them from the crowd if they were racist. Well, the day came and people just marched from the airports and from the train stations and from the bus stations. And they filled up the streets. And not a car moved in downtown Washington that day. It was, it was so glorious. It was so exciting. And all our, all our belief in nonviolent direct action sort of was vindicated. Because they're sure there were people who they were racist with their signs. And they didn't need to be insulated. People just walked right by them as though they were some sort of freak show, left them to themselves. And we stood and we filled up that mall and we filled up each side of the reflecting pool. And some people took off their shoes and waited in the reflecting pool. And Dr. King got up there, and he had a prepared speech. And it was an important milestone that all the speeches had to be cleared through Bayard Rustin, because there were different elements and different interests and different concerns. And some people were afraid that uh, some of the students, for example, in SNCC wanted very much. There was this classic battle between Jim Foreman and John Lewis. John Lewis had become head of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee at this point. And, uh, Jim Foreman was saying, look, if, if, we, if they aren't going to give us this law, we should tell them that we're going to just go violent. We can't, we can't be nonviolent this long. And if that were to have been in the speech, John Lewis would not have been allowed to speak. And so everybody had to submit their 
speeches to Bayard Rustin, and Martin King submitted his as well. And his was a good speech, but it was a different speech. It was a different speech. John Lewis gave a speech of peace, incidentally, but when it came for Martin Luther King to speak, he gave his speech, and he looked out upon that crowd, and then, whether it was the force of God or whatever, he ad-libbed that I had a dream. That gorgeous speech came out of his heart at the moment. That great statement, that great commitment that we all repeat, just from his heart, from his soul. Well, we went on. We, we did bring that change about. We did get a change in the laws. And as we're going to talk about in this class for the rest of the semester, that's just the first step. Well, the first step was getting it on the agenda. The second step was getting it implemented in legislation or getting it enacted, and then the next step was to implement it, to carry it out, to carry it forward. And that's what we did. That's what you're going to do in this class when we deal with the problems of the homeless, because that's in the spirit of that great man. I'd like to close this a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit corny, but I'd like you to indulge an old man. Let's hold hands and let's sing. If you don't know the words, you'll learn them very quickly. This is a song that uh, started out uh, in the Carolina Sea Islands. I, I mentioned Carolyn Severance and uh, the Sea Islands in their first pass part of this class. That's where this song came from. It was I Will Be All Right. And as it traveled across the Appalachians and found its way to the Highlander Folk School, a place where civil rights leaders were trained by Miles and Sophia Horton. It became the song of the school and it was transmuted into We Shall Overcome. And we'll sing, We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I know that I do believe we shall overcome someday. Black and white together, black and white together, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I know that I do believe. We shall overcome someday. The truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free, set you free today. Everyone. Oh, deep in my heart I know that I do believe we shall overcome someday. Thank you.